Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to our IGB Distinguished Public Lecture in Genomics. This is also Mom's Weekend here at the University of Illinois, so I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you who are visiting our campus this weekend, and thank you for including our lecture in your weekend activities. So shout out to moms, some expected moms in the audience, and we're so delighted that you're here. And for all of you moms in the audience, uh, let me just say that I'm going to be returning to the theme of moms at the end of my introduction, so hold on. My name is Gene Robinson. I'm the director of the Carl R. Woes Institute for Genomic Biology, one of the research institutes on the campus of the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Our institute, known as IGB, has a specific interest in all things related to genomics. This is a public lecture. I want to welcome all the members of the public. So let me just take a quick digression to say you really just only need to know three things about genomics. Uh, it's a young field, and so we're all still learning about genomics. It's only about 30 years old. So just three things. One, genomics is the study of all the DNA in any organism, and that includes but is not limited to the genes, so all the DNA. Secondly, all organisms on our planet have DNA. So at our core, every one of us and all organisms were made of the same stuff, corn plant, bacteria, fish or especially relevant to today's lecture, human beings. Third and final point you need to know is that there are genomes in each and every one of our cells, in each and every one of the cells of every organism on the planet, and they influence how we develop, how we grow, how we behave, and how we react and respond to the environment, okay? That's the primer, no test, nothing. Now go back to the introduction. Uh, this lecture series, focuses on areas of science and genomics that have specific and recognizable impacts on our daily life, tapping some of the leading practitioners and thought leaders in the field. And our speaker today, Professor Francois Bayliss, certainly fits the profile as one of the leading thought leaders in the field. We're proud to bring Professor Bayliss to you in a special co-sponsorship with our sister institute on the UIUC campus, the Humanities Research Institute, which fosters interdisciplinary study in the humanities, arts, and the social sciences. So this has been a real collaboration, and I'm doing the introduction, and Professor Antoinette Burton, uh, who is the director of HRI, will be moderating the question-answer session at the end. <coughs> Professor Bayless's research on designer babies touches on both the technological and societal implications of using genomics to make designer babies, making this collaboration really very appropriate with the HRI. Professor Francois Bayliss grew up in Montreal, Canada, received her doctorate in philosophy with a specialization in bioethics from the University of Western Ontario. She is now the Distinguished Research Professor Emerita at Dalhousie University. She is one of the most well-known bioethicists uh, in the world, especially as it relates to genomics. Her research encompasses such topics as human genome modification, women's health, assisted reproductive technologies, human embryo research, gene editing, novel genetic technologies, and how these subjects intersect with applied ethics, health policy, and practice. Professor Bayliss is a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of Nova Scotia, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, foundational fellow of the International Science Council. She's also won the Killian Prize for the Humanities, one of the highest awards in Canada, the Canadian Bioethics Society Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Queen Elizabeth II Platinum Jubilee Medal. She's also a member of the Governing Board of the International Science Council, the Planning Committee for the Third International Summit on Human Genome Editing, and the World Health Organization Working Group on Principles, the Global Guidance Framework for the Responsible Use of Genomics in the Life Sciences. This appointment gives her a powerful vantage point to consider advances in genomics in the context of health and wellness and how it relates to policy, practice, and bioethics. In addition to all of these honors and accolades, and there are many and they're well deserved, it turns out that Professor Bayliss also has a rather unique connection to the University of Illinois, which is especially appropriate to mention during Mom's Weekend. Professor Bayliss's mother was Gloria Bayliss, 
who was born in Barbados and emigrated to Canada. There she emerged as a civil rights activist, a registered nurse, and if that isn't enough, an entrepreneur, a very successful entrepreneur. In 1965, she won the first ever case of employment-related racial discrimination in Canada and served as a really emerging leader in that space. And then later, founded the Bayless Medical Company, which has developed into an internationally renowned medical device company. At this point, you're wondering, how does a nerdy scientist know all of this really important non-scientific stuff? Well, let me tell you. Um, that's the payoff of collaborating with HRI, the Humanities Research Institute, uh, led by eminent historian Professor Antoinette Burton. Pro through Professor Burton, we learned about Professor Bayless's mother's story. And moreover, we learned that the story has been written up by another eminent historian on our campus, Professor Karen Flynn, who's right here. Karen, if you want to raise your hand, or <laughs> who wrote this up as a scholarly uh, endeavor. And actually, the article was awarded a premier award in history, the Hilda Neatby Prize in 2019 by the Canadian Historical Association. Last night, uh, we got together, and uh, I was delighted to be able to see Professor Bayliss and Professor Flynn uh, renew their and rekindle their connection uh, related to Francois' mom, and it was just really special to see that. Now, how's that for a mom's day? <laughs> so, right? Pretty good, right? Eight, stick with the HRI and IGB, we deliver. <laughs> so, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to call Professor Bayliss uh, to the podium. We're presenting this memento, and don't worry, we will mail it uh, to you, but uh, we really are so proud and happy that you're able to be here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, you can't imagine what a pleasure it is to be in a place that's warm <laughs> and uh, a place where I can actually see people's faces and bodies. Um, a lot of us have spent a lot of time on Zoom and uh, I tell you, being back in the world uh, is really special. So I wanna talk to you today about something that I think is important for all of us, regardless of what we do or what we think or where we've been or where we think we might want to go. And largely it's because I'm talking about the future of our species, right? So what is it that we think is important in terms of what it means to be human such that we would want those traits to um, remain, so to speak, and show up in the next generation? So the title of my talk is Designer Babies, What Are They and Do We Want Them? And so I'm gonna take you through, first of all, what they are. And one of the first things I want you to take away at the end of the first part of this talk is the ways in which I want to actually separate out what a lot of people think of as designer babies and tell you that they're not designer babies. Or at least that's the claim I wanna make. And I wanna suggest that we're only now, for the first time, really, really making designer babies. So what do I mean by that? When you talk about designer babies, many people are going to think about Louise Brown, right? The first IVF baby, 1978. And what is it that we do with the science? For the first time, we have the sperm and the egg outside of the body, put together in a Petri dish in a lab, and then put back into the uterus in the hope that you'll have implantation and an offspring. And this is the success in 1978. Now the thing that I want to just share with you, because a lot of times we actually only talk about the first of, and that's something we're thinking about in terms of science. And I say that because on the one hand we talk about how important science is and standing on the shoulders of giants, and yet we often celebrate individuals, as we did in this particular case with IVF. Nobody has heard of this woman or of the scientist beside her. This is actually the second IVF baby, born only three months later. Nobody knows that name, nobody knows that face. And in fact, the scientist ultimately committed suicide because could not get any recognition for his work. And it's actually a very interesting story in terms of how it is we do science. But my point is, an IVF baby is not a designer baby. Would this be a designer baby? This is a lesbian couple who wanted to have children. 
they're going to use donor sperm, and they specifically go looking for a donor such that they would statistically increase their chances of having a deaf child. They have an interest in doing this because that's how they understand their family, and they want this child to be a member of their family and a member of the deaf community. They actually have two children spaced apart. The first one is in 1997. The second is in 2002. In both cases, the same donor. And the donor is a family friend because when they went to a clinic to say, we'd like to get sperm, which is how you would get sperm typically, they say, what? No, no, no. We screen out for all kinds of defects or disadvantageous traits. Why would we have any sperm from a deaf person? So in fact, the clinics can't support that. And so then you have to think about, okay, so what are the traits that they are looking for? What are they screening out for? And if you speak or have friends that are in the deaf community, they will tell you there's a huge difference between diversity and disability. And why is it that you would think that a deaf couple would not want a deaf child? But my point is, this too is not a designer baby. Here we have another couple, and the technology being used here is something different. It's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And what happens here is we have the embryo outside of the body, and we have the ability to biopsy that embryo, which means basically when it's early. So imagine, you know, you get the egg and sperm together, you get the first cell, and then the cells divide. And when you get up to about eight cells, scientists can remove one of those cells look at it, look at the genetic material, and depending on what they're looking for, make certain kinds of determinations. Now, early on, the only thing they could find was sex, so they would know whether or not the embryo was going to be male or female, and if there were certain genetic diseases associated with sex, they would then say, well, look, we don't know for sure if this embryo will have that genetic disease, but we do know for sure it's male, so we won't transfer that. What's important about this case is that this is the first case called the savior sibling. And what happens in this case is that they're using this technology of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis not only to screen for something they want to get rid of, but also to screen for something they wanted. What they wanted was a child that would be HLA compatible with a child they already had because they had a child that was sick and they needed a bone marrow donor for the child and they couldn't find one. And so they decided to make a baby that could be a bone marrow donor for their child. So they had to screen for the HLA compatibility so that the, the child born could be a donor, but they had to screen out against the illness, in this case, Fanconi anemia. Adam Nash was the savior sibling for his sister, Molly Nash. You see them as babies, you see them as young kids. And my point is that Adam Nash is not a designer baby. We're now in the mid-2015, 2016, and we now have our Hollywood stars making choices about the kinds of children they want, and in this case, they wanted to have a girl baby, and so they used pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, nothing to do with looking for or against a particular trait having to do with a health condition, but just deciding that they would like a child of a particular gender, in this case, choosing a female sex, presumably thinking that sex and gender would align, um, and they have this child. And I want to say again, this too is not a designer baby. So at this point, you're saying, okay, okay, <laughs> what is a designer baby? All of these things, which are using all kinds of fancy technology, they look pretty designer-ish to me. Is that a Gucci baby? Is that a what, you know? Um, and now we're going to transition, okay? And so now, this is, I'm going to suggest, the first designer baby. And we don't actually know the name of this baby. We do know the name of the physician, Dr. Zhang. And he uses another new technology, which is called mitochondrial donation. And in colloquial terms, people have talked about this as the three-parent babies or three-parent IVF. So going back, they're using the IVF technology, so taking egg and sperm, putting them together in a dish. But there are certain children that have a genetic condition where we know that that genetic condition is in the DNA that's in the mitochondria. So I want you to think about an egg, right? So you've got the egg yolk. That's the nucleus. That's where the DNA is that is called nuclear DNA. And that's what makes us 
who we are, at least in terms of what the world sees phenotypically, right? It tells us our hair color, our height, or things like that. And if you imagine in the egg white, you have another kind of DNA, which is the mitochondrial DNA. And its, its purpose is actually very important in terms of powering the cell, but it's also really important in terms of lineage so that we know, because mitochondria is passed through the female line. So I have my mother's mitochondria, but my brother has my mother's mitochondria, and on and on. Some people have an illness that's a result of a fault in the DNA in the mitochondria, and so they decided that the way we'll treat this is we'll just replace the mitochondria. So for example, you might take the egg yolk from me and take your egg, and we'll take your egg white, please. And so we'll get rid of her nuclear DNA because we've decided we don't want that, and we'll put my nuclear DNA into her egg white, and then we'll get what people will describe as my baby. And I want to suggest to you that that's already problematic. Like, why do you think the nuclear DNA is the one that will establish motherhood in some sense? Because it's a choice, right? We could decide differently, but we don't. And the reason I'm making the claim that this is the first attempt at really doing the designer baby is because all of the other cases involve selection. You're actually choosing from what's out there in the world. So you are still making choices, and those choices do have an impact. But here you're actually creating something that would not otherwise have been but for the human hand. This technology was used in order, in theory, to treat an ailment. And it has only ever been used since then for infertility. And I could go into a lot of details about that, but I actually think it's deeply problematic, the science there. But it is to say that's the designer baby. And then we now have a second kind of designer baby, which is really going to be the focus of my talk from here on in. And this is Jean Q. Hay. And some of you may remember hearing about him. It was just before the pandemic, just before, meaning about a year or so. In 2018, he created the first genome-edited babies. They were twins, nicknamed Lulu and Nana. And they were created such that they would have resistance to HIV. So the father in this case was HIV positive. The mother was not. A baby is created, again, using IVF technology. So you can understand how important IVF technology has been, the ability to have the egg and sperm outside of the human body. But what happens is he crispers the baby. So this technology has become a verb, amongst other things. What he does is he uses genetics to, uh, tools to change the genetics of these embryos, in this case, specifically looking at the CCR5 gene. So I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to show you two slides that are about science, and that's the end of the science, because I'm not a scientist. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. So now you know why everybody says CRISPR, right? And we're not going to be wanting to use that all the time. And these are the kinds of images you might see depending on where you look on the internet. Right, to try to create an image about what CRISPR is or isn't. But all you need to know is that compared to other technologies we had before we had this, it's thought to be more precise, more efficient, more flexible. And strictly speaking, it's actually, in the context of which it was used, CRISPR-Cas9. So CRISPR is actually what's called the guide RNA. You can see that in one of the pictures, but it's just a strand of DNA that actually helps the scientist take the Cas9 to the right place. And the Cas9 is a protein that basically is going to cut the DNA. So what it is, is it's a technology that allows you to get into those cells, find that DNA, and cut it. And then the most important thing to know after that is that you actually have pretty much no control after you've cut it. Right? So that's the human hand going in and cutting the DNA, and then basically relying on the cell's repair mechanism to do everything else that needs to be done. So this is an image that really is just trying to show that. There's two different ways in which it can happen. You take the DNA, which is double-stranded, you make a cut, and you allow the cell to repair it. And you hope that when the cell repairs that DNA, that it either knocks out something like remove something or put something in, but it's going to knock out the trait that you thought was problematic. So you're cutting the DNA, the cell will repair the DNA, and you're hoping it's going to have the effect that you wanted. And the second thing that we can sometimes do with that is we actually send in another piece of DNA that we're hoping the cell will copy and duplicate and put into its DNA strand. Okay? Now that's the really simple 
Cole's Notes version of the science. But that's all you really need to know from the ethics point of view. Why? Because you don't need to know more of the details than there's intent. There's intent to go in and to change DNA. And you may do it well, you may do it poorly. You're making a choice in terms of what gene or what part of the DNA you're trying to target. And you don't have control. Okay? So, now I want to introduce you to the scientists who have won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 for this work in CRISPR. This is Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. They've done amazing work, and it isn't often that women get celebrated in context of the Nobel Peace Prize, not Peace, sorry, the Nobel Science Prizes, and so I just wanted to give them a moment that we honor these women. Okay, so now you know what I think a designer baby is, and now I want to ask the next question, do we want them? And the we here is kind of ambiguous, right? So you can think of it as yourself, you can think of it as a scientific community, or you can think of it more broadly as the community writ large. So do we want them? Well, there are some scientists that really do. This is a Russian scientist, Denis Rebikov, and after there was the whole kerfuffle with Jean Q. Hay and the two babies that he made, and the world was very negative, shall we say, in terms of whether or not this constituted a good use of science and scientific talent, Denis Rebikov comes along and says, yeah, 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 he just did it wrong. I'm going to do it better. And he thought, you picked something really stupid, like HIV resistance. No, no, I'm going to pick something really important. And he actually picks deafness. That's what he's going to solve using CRISPR. Now, we haven't heard very much from Dennis Rebikov since then, but he certainly had a number of articles in high-impact journals like Science and Nature talking about his claims that he too was going to go down this path, but he was going to do the work that Jean Q. Hay had done with greater efficacy. One of the other things that happens very quickly in science is that somebody can figure out how to make a buck, right? Oh, we can do this. And so we had a clinic in Ukraine uh, planning to sell CRISPR enhancements. And the examples I put up there are actually what were in the ad, color, skin, and breast size. And you think, wow, that's a good use of talent. So we have some people that want it. And one of the things that's interesting is here's a very controversial scientist. Um, but also a very well-known scientist, Jim Watson, who actually, when you know, spoken with about this, says, people say we're playing God, and his answer is, well, if we don't play God, who will? I want you to hold on to that thought, because I think there's a fair bit of hubris there. And one of the things that's interesting is that Jean Q. Hay spoke with Watson prior to doing his work and asked him what he thought about this, and he said, make people better. That was Watson's answer to him. And so Jean Q. Hay believes that he was making people better. Jean Q. Hay also truly, genuinely believed, and I don't know if he still does, that he would get a Nobel Prize for his work. And he said explicitly, don't you remember what happened in 1978 when the first IVF baby was born? Everybody said this was terrible, but they gave him a Nobel Prize. He says, and I'm willing to take that chance, right? I mean. He actually said those two things, right? And so I want you to appreciate the context within which you have a person, Edwards, who gets the Nobel Prize for making the first IVF baby in a context where the world was very angry where this was done, and now it's become almost routine in certain circles. And you have an eminent scientist, Jim, Jim Watson, encouraging him, make people better. So there's lots of people that think this is a really good idea. And then we also have people who aren't so confident and interestingly, they've used the language of GM, genetically modified. We don't want genetically modified babies. And this is the same group four years later. And this is in front of an exhibit called Cut and Paste, which is at the Crick Institute, where I was in March, where we were having the meeting of the third international summit on human genome editing. And they were outside picketing, which they have a right to do, and which is very important. But just so that you appreciate, my point is that this is contemporary, right? This is like last March. And it's not just in England. You see it in France, in Europe, and other places where people are coming out. And they're not just coming out and marching. They have creative websites that are designed to help and to educate and to engage other people in this conversation about what we do or don't want to do. And then in some work that I did uh, and completed just recently, but I'm about to update with colleagues, is we actually mapped out the world to try to figure out what are the rules and regulations with respect to this science. And what's really critically important is that there's no green on this map. So right now, there is actually no country that explicitly permits 
this research. There are many countries that explicitly prohibit it, either in legislation or regulations. And there's a number of countries where we were unable to identify information. But I just want you to appreciate so far, what have we done? We're pretty clear we know what a designer baby is now, right? Human hands intervention. And people are split, at least in terms of how they see things. And you see a lot of enthusiasm on the part of the scientific community. You see a lot of concern on the part of civil society. But I don't want to pretend that those are monolithic blocks, right? You also have those different perspectives portrayed on either side and all the range in between. So I want you to hold on to that, and I now want to take you on a fast tour of history. And it's only my version of history, and it starts in 2015, because that's kind of when I can sort of document what was going on. But I want to put all of this now in a context for you to think about where do you stand with respect to this idea of designer babies? So what's the context? I want you to leave with one other little bit of science, which has to do with language. In the area of genome editing, and so making changes to people's DNA, we can make changes in different ways. We can make changes to what are called somatic cells. And your somatic cells are just your body cells. So my hair cells, my liver cells, my skin cells, right? All the cells of my body except my reproductive cells. Those are my somatic cells. When you make changes to a person's somatic cells, those changes die with the person. You then have germline cells, and those are, in fact, your reproductive cells, your gametes, your egg and sperm, your very early stage embryo, and on the other end, the precursors to the gametes. That work, when it happens in the lab, gets referred to as germline genome editing. There's no intent to reproduce. There's no intent to move those cells out of the lab. And then with heritable genome editing, you're doing exactly the same work that you would be doing with germline, but you're putting it into a uterus. You have a reproductive project. The reason I want to make sure that I insist on this is because in the early days, in 2015, if you go and you read the literature, we don't have it divided up that way. In 2015, we only talked about somatic and germline because we were mapping it onto the two cells, nothing to do with human intent. So you're either working on somatic cells, all the cells of the body except for the reproductive cells, or you're working on reproductive cells. And what's happened is the scientific community got up in arms to sort of say, well, that's not fair because you're going to say this is great and this is bad. And it's more complicated in terms of what's happening in the scientific context. And why couldn't we do work on the germline if we have no intention to transfer this to a body to make another human? And so it's only recently that we've actually had this parsing. And I wanted to share that with you because if any of you want to go back and actually look at some of what I'm going to tell you with my history starting in 2015, the language will be muddled. Okay, so this is the beginning of the history. An article in Nature, an article in Science are two high impact journals. It's late March, early April when these two articles are published. They are specifically about heritable human genome editing, but they're using the language of the germline. Okay, they're not drawing that distinction I just talked about. And one of them is saying, don't do this. Do not edit the human germline. The people writing this are scientists that are doing work on somatic cells, and quite frankly, they're worried that if people get all exercised about germline modification, it's going to affect their ability to develop therapies for somatic cells to help offer therapeutics to people with illnesses. So they're saying, don't go there. On the other side, you have another set of scientists that say, no, we just need to do it carefully. Let's go forward slowly, carefully. Let's find a way. So we're looking for what? A prudent path forward. Okay. This is 2015, end of March, beginning of April. Mid-April, this fellow here publishes a, a paper where? In protein and cell. And guess what? It's a paper that's showing proof of concept that we could actually do this work. And now you should be thinking like, wow, the science paper comes out two weeks after all these commentaries in Nature and Science? Isn't that interesting? Turns out he submitted the paper to Nature and Science and it got refused on ethics grounds. Isn't that interesting? So they refused the science paper. They publish these commentaries. The science paper does come out. And all of that together becomes the impetus for what becomes the first international summit on human genome editing held here in Washington in December 2015. Full disclosure, I'm on the planning committee for that meeting. At the end of that meeting, we issue a statement, 
and the statement has a lot of stuff in it, but what's important for today's talk is it says you can't do this work ethically unless and until two criteria are met, safety and efficacy and broad societal consensus. Now, for those of you who don't do ethics, that's like the simplest ethics framework you'll ever see. Only two elements, right? Ethicists tend to have all kinds of conditions before you can do anything that would be ethical. Think about this, two elements, like that's so simple. And I'm really chuffed, right? Because I think, great, I've got an ethics framework, only two elements. And the reason I'm really chuffed is because I know that although it appears really simple, it is actually so complicated. I got work for the rest of my life just unpacking what those two sentences are going to mean, right? Because what does it mean to say it's safe and effective or efficacious? According to what standards? And in fact, it's never going to be 100%, right? It's not going to be safe and effective 100%. So somebody is going to have to decide it was safe enough. It was effective enough. It's good to go. Well, what does that mean? Like, that's actually a really, really interesting, complex question, just unpacking what that means. And then there's this notion of broad societal consensus. Well, what does that mean? So I think it's wonderful. It's simple, and yet it's complex. And it actually asks us to do some really important work in terms of values. So that's what happens. It's December. It's 2015. And after that, the National Academy of Sciences goes off and does its own work coming out of that meeting. And the first meeting was sponsored by the National Academy as well. And this is what they say, which is different. So I, it's called germline genome editing. I put in brackets heritable so we know what we're talking about. And they say that it would be OK to permit clinical research trials, clinical research meaning you're going into the clinical setting, you're going into humans, right? Only for compelling purposes. But what I want you to appreciate is that you've had a shift. The first shift says you can't do it unless and until. And this one says, of course you can do it, provided that, right? Very different starting point. One says you can't do it unless and until. And the next one says, of course you can do it, provided that. Jean Q. Hay relies on this. I can do it. I just have to have a compelling reason. And Jean Q. Hay, the infamous person who makes the first genome edited baby, says, I have a compelling reason. I want to provide resistance to HIV. And perhaps you in North America don't think that that's a sufficient reason, but he argues in my country, in China, it is, because people with HIV are completely socially ostracized. They can't get jobs, they can't have community, they can't have children if they need to use IVF because you're legally not allowed to. So he says it's a compelling reason. And he has a whole narrative about why he thinks he has met the standard. I think he's wrong on a lot of counts, but he actually says, I have lots of people who were telling me this was okay. In written reports, Jim Watson, it must be okay. This happens in 2018, and it happens on the eve of the second international summit on human genome editing, which is held in Hong Kong. And again, under the conflict of interest statement, I now get to say very proudly, I was not part of the planning committee for the second international summit. Not that anybody could have predicted that Jean Q. Hay was going to do this, but because I don't agree with the conclusion that came out of that second meeting. So out of the second meeting, basically it's saying it could become acceptable in the future. So they say very clearly what Jean Cuhay did was wrong, but in the future, it could be acceptable. And not only that, what he did was wrong, they say, but now, now is the time to define a rigorous, responsible, translational pathway towards such trials. That's like a 180, right? So 2015, you say you can't do it unless and until. 2018, you say, well, yeah, it could be acceptable in the future. We just have to have a responsible kind of framework for doing this and Jean Cuhay didn't meet those standards. Three years, and I want to tell you, not a lot changed in the science for this to have happened. And think about the juxtaposition of being completely critical of what he's done and choosing, as a scientific community, not to repeat the conclusion of 2015 and say, but we told you you couldn't do this unless and until. No, they don't repeat the recommendations of 2015. You do this shift. And moreover, they talk about what would be the elements of a rigorous, responsible pathway forward. These are those elements. 
Now, in the interest of time and not boring you, I'm not going to go through all of those elements, but I am going to share with you just one thing, which is the compelling medical need. Because if you remember, that's what the NAS document says in 2017, that you could be done for compelling reasons. So compelling medical need, and they give examples, and I'm just going to take you through one. Basically, the point that they make is that heritable human genome editing is very important technology to use in a reproductive context if you have a couple who otherwise could not have a healthy genetically related child. And these are the two classic examples, right? So you have a family where one person has Huntington's disease and it's there as a dominant disorder, or you have a couple with cystic fibrosis and it's a recessive trait, but the point is under no circumstances could either of these couples have an unaffected embryo for transfer. So it's not a situation whereby they could have a child and maybe the child would be a carrier or maybe the child would be healthy or maybe the child would be afflicted and then we could use our pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to identify the one that we wanted to transfer. Remember, if we go back to that version of what some people thought was a designer baby but isn't, Right? They're saying, no, 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 we actually have some couples that can't use any technology that's currently available. And for those few people, this is a compelling need. We need to be able to respond to their desire for a genetically related healthy child. Okay? That's the claim that's made. I've argued against that, and in conversation afterwards, I'm happy for people to challenge me on that, and we can talk about it. But if you're gonna challenge me, I wanna just put it in context for you. This is just the example from cystic fibrosis, and the only thing you need to look at is the last line, which is that even if I buy your story that it's really, really important, you're gonna to need to use it once every 15 years. And that's just, the, the math is there, and I've put the reference down for the academic paper, and it's basically showing that if you take that population, you imagine that two people find each other, happen to want to have children together, happen to have all the money in the world to pay for it, and you've done the science to do it, you would actually use it in North, this is just, the numbers here are just for the United States, so yeah, if we take the world, it's gonna be a bit more, right? Once every 15 years. And one of my themes in all of my work is that we should pay attention to our resources. And in science, our resources are people. It's talent. It's the talent of the scientific community. The resources are also financial. It costs money to do this science. And the resources are also time. And so I say loudly, do you want to use your time, talent, and treasure in pursuit of this goal? We live in a world with a lot of problems. Is this the problem we need to tackle? One of the things that's really interesting is in nature, they actually put out um, a statement at the end of every year, for those of you who may or may not be aware of it, where they talk about the 10 people who mattered this year. Both of those scientists made it. This was the 2015 work, and this is the 2018 work, and they are both 10 people who mattered in those respective years. So it's really interesting to think about what does it mean to say the scientists who mattered? And there's only 10 that get this profile. Let me take you a little bit more quickly along. This is 2019, and this is a paper that's written and published in Nature. I'm a co-author on this paper. Eric Lander, who may be known to some of you, is the first author. And what's important about this paper is that several of us were on the planning committee for the 2015 meeting, not on the planning committee for the 2018 meeting, which now becomes permissive. And we say, OK, that's it. We're calling for a moratorium. And the thing that's really interesting in that context is two of the three scientists who at the time were touted to be the potential Nobel laureates signed on, and one of them did not. So this, uh, this is 2019. The Nobel Prize has not been given out till 2020. Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna were anticipated to be winners. And the third person, amongst others, could have been Feng Shang, who's at the Broad. Feng Shang is a co-author, Emmanuel Charpentier is a co-author, Jennifer Doudna is not. And Jennifer was asked, just to be clear, so it was a choice. So it's really interesting to think then also about the role of scientists in the public space. So scientists contribute to the world, not only in the science that they do, but how they position themselves relative to important political and historical issues. And here's another Nobel laureate that may be known to to some of you, um, he chaired, this is David Baltimore, he chaired both the 2015 and the 2018 
meetings. So he was there for the first and the second international summit. And again, what I want you to see is what's in red. After the second international summit, he actually says, to make rules is probably not a good idea. I disagree with David Baltimore. I think rules are a great idea. And they're a great idea for everybody, because then you know where the guardrails are. And if you don't like the rules, then you've got something to push up against. But to live in a world where you don't know what the rules are, it's actually not good for anybody. Jean Q. Hay ended up in jail, just so that that's clear. He was there. He got a sentence of three years and three million yuan, and two other scientists were jailed with him. And that was the response of the Chinese government to the work that he did. But because there weren't clear, explicit rules there, he actually went to jail for practicing medicine without a license. The work continues in the meantime in a policy context, and these are other reports that have since been published. Um, the one that came out from WHO is the one on the far You're right, the far right in blue is the uh, one that I worked on with WHO, and in that context, tried to provide a framework for what are the values, what are the principles that we should bring to bear in doing this kind of work, recognizing that different countries can do ultimately whatever they want, but how is it that you could move towards some kind of consensus? And the third international summit just happened in 2023 in March in the UK and conflict of interest disclosure. I am back on the planning committee for the third international summit. And the thing that was really important for me, at least in terms of trying to make a contribution to the closing statement, is to get the word whether in there instead of the word how. It's to say, we actually need to have conversations about whether this technology should be used, as opposed to the emphasis on how the technology can be used, whether we think of the how in terms of the science or whether we think of the how in terms of the policy, that we haven't had those right conversations yet. And again, emphasizing that we need to have the societal discussion and debate, and that hasn't happened. right? So we called for that in 2015. It hasn't happened. And so when I put it together for you, this is what I'd like you to take away. In 2015, we actually say it would be irresponsible. In 2017, in the NASA report, it actually says it should be permitted for compelling reasons and under strict oversight. And I want you to think about what those compelling reasons might be. And then in 2018, after the summit, after Jean Q. Hay makes these genome-edited babies, it's time to define a rigorous, responsible translational pathway towards this goal. And then finally in 2023, a re-emphasis on public discussions, policy debates have to continue. And again, emphasis on whether this technology should be used. And so for me, one of the things that's really important with science is to understand that we actually have choices we can make. And the most important choice actually comes around the concept of what we think of as progress, right? We're gonna keep moving, but how do we know what direction we're going in? So I'm going to end this last section with me, because it's all about me, right? Um, I want to talk to you about Bayless and bioethics in this space. 2015 for me was a really important year because I was really excited about the fact that we had this very simple ethics framework and really excited about the fact that we didn't know what it meant. And I mean that really genuinely, because I think that's what's interesting about academia, is not having all the answers, right? But setting a goal for yourself. And so here, for me, I have a goal, and my goal is to figure out what's broad societal consensus. And so I set off to do that, and in my work, I've done a lot of work in the space of bioethics with the metaphor of architecture. And so for me, if you want to have conversations and policy debates, you want to do that in a space where it's as open and welcoming to everybody. And so a lot of my work is like, well, how do you create those spaces? And so this is a talk that I gave in Berlin. I gave this talk on the day that Trump was elected. I am in Berlin at a celebration of taking down the Berlin Wall, and I learned that this country has elected a person who wants to put up walls. And I, and I say that because I remember the day so clearly because my whole work is about taking down walls. And so part of what I say in this context is this conversation can't happen in the walls of a lab. Why? Because what's at issue is too important to leave to the scientific community alone. And I firmly believe that. And scientists are my friends, right? Or some of them are. But, you know, you can't think that this decision belongs to the scientific community. So you have to take it outside those walls. And I then have this image of the boardroom. And what I'm trying to communicate there is this decision doesn't belong to the companies 
that fund this research. And it also doesn't belong to individual governments. And so the boardroom is meant to kind of capture both of those spaces. And I want you to think about how both of those spaces are actually pretty alienating if you're not one of them, right? Like there's a lot of ritual around what you do in boardrooms, right? And if that's not part of your space, you're not gonna be very comfortable there. And to shorten the rest of that part of that talk, you know, I propose we should have these conversations in kitchens, right? And I point out that everybody kind of has to go to the kitchen, right? Like, if you have that as a metaphor for food, we all need to eat. But I want all of you to think about the kinds of conversations you have in kitchens, right? They're very different, and they are open to everybody. And we actually know that something changes when conversations that were taboo can now happen at the dinner table, right? Let's go back to IVF. There was a time when people would have been ashamed to tell you that they had an infertility problem. And now you can sit around the dinner table and you can talk about people's IVF and their drug cycles, right? Or whether or not they've decided to use donor sperm. So I wanted to say, we need to think about the spaces within which these conversations are happening. And when people don't come to your conversation, it's actually your responsibility. How did you fail to create a welcoming environment? And what is it that you could do to create a welcoming environment for that conversation to happen? I've spent a lot of time now writing about this notion of broad societal consensus, and the only part of this slide that's important is what's at the bottom, because these are the kinds of concepts I work with, and so this is what we need to be able to do. We need to be able to answer calls for inclusivity. We need to think about responsibility. How do you participate responsibly in conversation? Self-discipline. How do you take yourself out of a conversation when it's not productive? Respect. You want to be respected? You've got to show some respect. What does that mean in terms of a meaningful conversation? Cooperation? Struggle. It's going to be hard. What does it mean to understand going into the conversation? It's going to be hard. And the last one is benevolence, which I'm thinking of changing to kindness. right? Because if you know you're going to go into a space that's going to be hard, people are going to be hurt because it's hard work. And how do we not rupture relationships? And I have a whole thing I'd love to say about COVID, but that's not today's talk, right? And we've learned a lot about humans through the pandemic. So consensus. When people push back against my ideas, they say, oh yeah, Francoise, what does that mean? You know, what, we're gonna have a big you know, global vote, and if 75% of the world says? And one of the things that I try to keep saying is that that's not what it is. It's not about majority rule. It's not about unanimity. It's about unity. What's really important here is not that everybody speaks, but that we're confident that all ideas were on the table. And that means that we actually believe that maybe we didn't have all the ideas, right? And there's growth that can happen in that context. So what does it mean to have a conversation where you have confidence that everything's on the table? Well, I think you can now see why I'm talking about things like respect, right? because you have to listen to things that maybe don't make sense to you or that you wouldn't appreciate or you wouldn't have thought of. I'm gonna end with a couple of excerpts from my book, Altered Inheritance. And the reason I wanna share this with you is just because it's just gonna give you a brief aperçu of one chapter. So if you like anything that I said, none of this is in the book. This is the only thing that overlaps with the book. So there's all kinds of things that uh, you might find interesting. But I wanted to share this with you. I wanted to talk to you about the potential harms of this science. Why? Not because I don't think that the science is exciting, not because I don't think that the science can't be developed. I'm actually, at the end of the day, agnostic. It's a complicated kind of agnosticism, but anyhow. My point is, people can easily figure out what the potential benefits are, and I've already told you some of them, right? But what I want people to do is to not just run down this path really enthusiastically, but to think what are the potential harms. I've actually got a slide for each of these, but I'm not gonna take you through them. I'm just gonna show them to you very quickly and move along. But the main thing I wanted to do is to put up on this first slide the fact that I'm one of the few people that talks about the harms to women. And the reason I always have them first is eggs don't sit on shelves. And eggs don't grow in boxes. Women's bodies have to be used for this science. They have to be used to get the genetic material. And yes, it's true, you also need sperm but sperm's a lot easier to get. And so we need to think about what we're asking women to do when we ask them to donate eggs to research. And we need to think about what we might be asking women to do when we ask them to participate in having the transfer of a genetically modified embryo to their bodies. And I don't think we do enough work thinking about that. 
The other stuff I think is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to put the slide up there, and I appreciate that we're not going to take a lot of time, but it is just to say I want you to think about all of the participants, starting with the women. I then want you to think about the prospective parents and whether they actually understand they'd be participating in a research project and that things could go wrong. Remember those two slides about science, all you're doing is cutting and maybe you're sending in a piece of DNA and then you're trusting the cell to do its work. And the thing that's interesting is people who talk about this as though it's secure like engineering and it's not. I mean, that's why biology is different. It can do things all by itself. Beyond that, we need to think about the harms to future children. And I think that there's some of those harms that are potentially biological. There's some of them that I think could be psychological. What happens if you start thinking of yourself as a product, right? You were designed for something, right? Because when you design something, you actually have a goal or an objective, right? What does it mean to be somebody's design project? How do we think about this in the context of society? Think about the fact that because this is design, you are choosing certain traits. What does that say about what you think about the world, that this was a trait that makes it on the have list, and this trait's on the have not list? And what about the rest of us who actually have those traits right now? And what does it mean to think about a world like that? And then very briefly, we could think about this in terms of the gene pool. This is kind of like science fiction because I don't think it'll ever happen in a way that you would imagine that everybody's going to start reproducing by IVF, right? But it's worth thinking about, right? This is exercising the moral imagination so that you're actually thinking about what could or couldn't happen. I'm coming to a close and I want to say really clearly, this is a wonderful, I think, anecdote. So one day, Alice comes to a fork in the road, she saw a Cheshire cat in a tree, and she says, which road do I take? Where do you want to go? I don't know. Then says the cat, well, it really doesn't matter. That's not the world we want to live in. We actually want to know whether we want to go to the right or the left. And that's why I say we have to have some conversation about what's progress. Is progress going to the right or to the left? We might still be thinking we're going forward, but that's a really different path. And it ought to be a conscious path. And I want to say to you that the conscious past means you have to engage with this question. This is the most important question. It's, in fact, the only question. We get distracted by the question of, should we use heritable human genome editing? And I'm saying, you can't answer that question unless you can tell me the answer to this question. It's only when you know what kind of world you want to live in that you can then figure out, will this technology help me build that world? So I'm asking you, do you know the kind of world you want to live in? I've told you about the designer babies that we have in the world right now. They're few in number, less than 1,000. They are children born of either the mitochondrial donation that I didn't spend any time talking about, or they're born of genome editing, and there will be more. But this is the science of this year, and this is not done in humans. It's done in animal models. We have now created mice using genetic material from two males. We have a proof of concept. What would it mean to choose to make babies from two males, two human males? And we now have synthetic embryos that have been made and implanted into female monkeys. We have, just so that it's clear, made synthetic human embryos. So we actually have that ability. We have not yet transferred a synthetic human embryo to a human. The work in monkeys doesn't go very far. I think, if I'm remembering, it maybe goes to 17 days is the longest they lasted. The point is, the question is, what kind of world do you want to live in? We are living in a world already with some designer babies, and the designs are going to get more complicated. The potential is there, and the science will keep moving, and we have choices to make. And what I want you to think about is this image. The one thing you should see really clearly, the inherent desirability of whiteness, right? Like that's what you think is the ideal human? There's a clear elimination of disability of any kind, whatever we want to think of as disability. And the interesting thing is that this all gets framed in the context of a certain kind of liberal eugenics. Well, it's a private decision. Right? People are making private reproductive choices. Well, if the world ends up looking like this, I don't think that's a private reproductive choice. And so I think we have to have a conversation about it. So 
I leave you with this. This is the most important question. What kind of world do you want to live in? And I'm going to end by saying, this is the world that I want to live in. It's a world that promotes equity and justice and celebrates difference. A world that embraces neighborliness, reciprocity, social solidarity, and community. And a world that values collegial as opposed to competitive relations. And what I say to you is think about this sentence. There is a world of difference between making people better, which may or may not be what Jim Watson said, that's what we heard from Jean Q. Hay. There is a world of difference between making people better and making better people. Thank you. What an amazing journey you've taken us through in the last hour. We've gone from the scale of the gene to the scale of global governance, and we've traversed all the incredibly extraordinary entanglements of the humanities and the sciences uh, in, in an amazing uh, panoply of images and, and facts and interpretations. Thank you so much. Another round of applause. Professor Bayless has generously agreed to take questions from the floor, and I'm sure you've got some, so please step up to the mic uh, and speak into it. Maybe introduce yourself um, right before you ask your question, and um, we'll proceed from there. Just that the genotype to phenotype pathway is not clear. It's not direct. Um, there's environmental interactions. There's epigenetics. There's all kinds of influences that make it not direct. Um, and that kind of variation has come up uh, in these discussions about designer babies. Yes. Um, so first of all, I didn't say it, but I want to be really clear. I don't believe in genetic determinism. And that's sometimes not necessarily so obvious from the way we sort of have conversation in this area. So I think that's actually a really great opportunity for me to remind everybody um, about gene-environment interaction. And we are not just our genes. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why early on I said, I actually don't think it's all that important to have the reification of the gene in the context of thinking that's what's important in terms of becoming a parent, so that what matters is that we have genetically related children. And it also, I think, for me anyhow, it's why I also made that comment about sex and gender and making assumptions that, oh, we're going to have a female baby. So, you know, what you're really choosing is not genitalia. What you're choosing is a way of being in the world, and you're making assumptions about how people will be um, in the world. So first of all, yes, your point is extremely um, important. I would say that in this particular space, um, you don't see a lot of that conversation. And it's not that people aren't smart and they don't know it, but there is this real kind of thing where everything is like a gene for this and that, right? Everything is the gene for this, the gene for that. And people get swept up in that way of thinking. And what is also true is that right now, all of this is mostly single gene disorders. And I think that's why people kind of, you know, they will say, oh, intelligence, no, we'll never really be able to do that. It's complex, but they actually are meaning First of all, complexity in terms of what's spread out throughout the DNA. And I think they are attentive in that sense to the fact that there's much more at stake. But I will say a lot of the conversations are happening kind of like, yeah, yeah, we all know about that, but let's talk about the gene. But thank you for that comment, because I, I don't want anybody leaving here thinking that I don't appreciate that difference. I certainly do. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned that this kind of conversation should happen in a kitchen. Um, and as somebody who is the only scientist in my close relative family, um, I'm wondering how you propose to educate people who struggle to understand the basics of this to even start this conversation. Well, thanks for that question. I guess um, 
I think it's a really important question because I actually think that is what needs to happen. So I actually think you have a, a really important responsibility, and not just to your immediate circle, but to any people you interact with. And that's actually one of the reasons why when I crafted this talk, which I knew was going to be for you know, a broader audience, that I made a point of having two slides that really were science. Because I was trying to say, like, you, know, you need to know a little bit about it, but you don't really need to know a whole lot to actually become engaged. Because what matters to you is the questions that I just need to tell you that this is possible in the world, and is that the kind of world that you want? And one of the things I encourage people to think about is like, if you needed to have knee surgery, right? What is it that you really want to know at the end of the thing? You want to know, well, am I going to be able to walk again? Might I be able to run again? Am I going to have to use a cane? Is it going to have a scar? How long will my recovery be? You're not actually saying, well, I, I need to actually see a video of the whole surgery before I can consent to this, right? Like, what matters to you is that you think the person's competent, so maybe you'll ask for their CV, I don't know. But I mean, I think we, we get lost sometimes in thinking that people need to know more details than they do to be able to make really important and intelligent contributions. So if you accept my hypothesis that the most important question is what kind of world do you want to live in, I think people have a lot that they can bring to that conversation. Um, and I think for, for me right now, the bigger challenge is the, the lack of trust we're seeing and some disinformation around what science can contribute. And I think that's what worries me. Um, because I do believe that science is about knowledge production. I think there are many ways in which we can produce knowledge. And we have an obligation to share that knowledge. And I think it's really hard when you're enthusiastic and you're out there doing that work and people don't want to embrace the knowledge that you're trying to share. So it's challenging. But I would encourage you to keep doing it. And you'd be surprised. Once people get into it, like, they'll go on and continue that conversation. And that's what happens with kitchen tables, right? Like you had it at this dinner party. And later on, you, you, know, you now have some tools that you can, have, you can start the conversation at the next dinner party. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I just have a, a, a quick question. Uh, one of your slides says, uh, to make a decision, um, uh, needed to have a consensus. Not everyone heard, but uh, all positions heard. We know everyone has a different opinion. Who is to make a decision? How do we balance the democracy, science, uh, politics, whatever? And so my question is just, right. you know, yeah, as you said, all positions are being uh, heard, right. but uh, how do you make it? So you have just put your finger on my current big problem. I don't know the answer to that question, okay? And I'm not being facetious. I don't know the answer to that question, okay? Mm -hmm. But what I do know is the following. Many of us actually have a lot of skills in terms of consensus building, and how do I know that? Because it is not the case that all families break up. It is not the case that all book clubs disintegrate. It is not the case that all church communities fall apart. It is not the case that all neighborhoods are at war. And in all of those kinds of places, not everybody agrees with each other. So we have found in small circles ways of compromising, ways of showing respect, ways of navigating difficult spaces. So my first challenge is to figure out how do we upscale that? Because I know we have some skills. How do we upscale, right? So that's the first challenge. I think technology is going to be able to help us. But I don't know what that is or if it's around right now. I think what we actually have, though, is some real problems around some of those core principles I put up there. So respect. What does respect mean? I don't think we know how to show respect to people with whom we disagree. Right? Um, and I think we could do a lot of learning. And, and the respect isn't just around disagreement, it's respect around different worldviews and values, right? And how do I show respect for somebody who maybe has a completely different religious framework than I do, or a completely different cultural background than I do? And we need to learn how to do that better. So I don't think we know how to do it, right? But I'm not prepared to kind of give up because I don't know how to do it. I'm prepared to say it's a project that we ought to work on. And I'm also prepared to say the following. When I give my talk about consensus building, I have slides where I literally put up people who disagree with me and what it is that they say as an alternative. And so in the UK, the Nuffield Council has said, no, 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 we can't have broad societal consensus. We're going to have broad societal debate. And so I look at them and say, great, so how do you know when the debate's over, Pete? Like, 
I mean, I know when my conversation's over because we've reached consensus. We may never get there, but I actually know what the goal is. What's your goal if you want to endorse broad societal debate? We're just gonna yell at each other forever? And what I end up saying at the end of the day is maybe everybody is right and I'm naive and Pollyannish and we will never reach it. But what I'm very, very confident about, we will be better off for having tried. We will be better off for having tried. Thank you. Thanks. Hi there. Thank you for sharing this with us today. So I'm coming from a conservation genomics perspective, so thinking about this in the context of endangered species. How do you think, you know, especially a lot of our species are being threatened by one specific thing. Bats have white nose syndrome. We've got chytrid disease for amphibians. No, actually, they're all being threatened by us. Yeah, <laughs> well, but there, a lot of these things are becoming driven by their primary threats are a disease. Sure. We can use this kind of technology. How do you think the ethics changes when we're thinking about humans and non-human animals? I think that's a great question, and the reason I think it's a really great question is because one of the things that we do right now with genomics is we actually use a lot of it just for humans, right? We modify food for humans. We modify animals for the benefit of humans. We modify ourselves, perhaps, for ourselves. So first of all, I think it's really important when we are able to shift that lens. I think there are some things, though, that are a bit questionable. So for example, um, George Church is working on the woolly mammoth. Many people know this. Um, you know, and I'm looking at, George, why are you doing this, right? It's not his favorite project, but it's certainly one that gets him a lot of notoriety. Um, and other people have talked about using it for other kinds of species. And I guess at the end of the day, I'm not sure what I'm wedded to, but there is a part of me that kind of is committed to a Darwinian view of the world and that things can and should disappear. And I want to be really clear, for me, that includes us as one of the animals. Um, and that's one of the things that's interesting, because a lot of people don't think that. Really, right? like part of this project, part of this design project, is because people actually, some people actually believe there's no reason for the human species to die off. Right? We have the ability to, to morph it, to create something different. And maybe we can't live on this planet, because <laughs> to your point indirectly, we're busy destroying this planet. right? Um, so we should just modify ourselves so we can live in a spaceship or on another planet, I don't know. Um, but I think I'm open to the idea that it's, it's actually okay. Um, it's not ideal that it be willful and through our intent as opposed to through other phenomena. But I'm not sure if that's the response to sort of use genetics to solve what is ultimately a social problem in some sense in the ways in which we're creating those, you know, either lack of habitat or infectious, you know, um, vectors or things like that. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. I'm not sure that I know what my answer is, but I think that's where I'm leaning. Could I ask a quick follow-up question? Can you just explain, so when you're talking about species that can and should disappear, are you including species that are driven to extinction purely because of anthropogenic impacts? That's where I'm saying there's a little bit of ambiguity because I'd rather that we change those impacts and not have that be the, the reason for it. So that's where I think, you know, I don't have a good clear answer for you because I, I just think we ought to behave differently in the world so that Agreed. we're not a threat, <laughs> um, both to ourselves and to other species. So. I think that's what I was meaning when I said we shouldn't be finding a biological solution to a problem that isn't a biological problem. It's a problem that we've created and that we could actually behave differently to, to obviate the need. And I think we do that a lot. We just kind of do things and we think, well, it'll be okay because we'll fix it afterwards. And it's like, well, why did we create it in the first place? And it's okay when we, well, okay, inverted commas, it's okay when we didn't know any better. But when we know better, why do we keep doing these things? Sure. Hi, my name is Allison. I'm an undergraduate researcher in plant biotechnology, and I really appreciate your speech. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I really agree with your point about inclusivity being one of the largest issues in science as a broad subject, right? Especially as a first generation student. Um, something that does come to mind is, you know, I do want to ask what voices do you think we should be illuminating, specifically from what communities? Um, when Sorry, we're, which communities? Which communities should we be illuminating in terms of asking, um, you know, why we should be doing this, if we should be moving forward? If not scientists, of course, if we're asking broadly, who should we be asking? Everyone. 
Everyone. Everyone. And I, and I, I don't mean that facetiously. I, I mean that really <laughs> truthfully. Um, certainly in the work that I alluded to with WHO, we made an effort, for example, you know, I made the comment earlier to go out to various indigenous communities. So we went out to the Maori in New Zealand. We went to the San people in um, South Africa. We spoke to indigenous communities. So culturally, we've looked at it. We looked at different religious groups. We look at people who you know, actually have a lot at stake in terms of capital investment. The, the point is lots of people have different perspectives and see the world differently. Differently, and we would be better off for trying to understand what it is that is driving the value. And the value might be to make money, or the value might be to you know, make this a more habitable planet, or the value might be to just get along with each other. The value might be to have genetically related children. Um, but I think what we want to do is we want to try to have those ideas out there such that we're in a position to say, maybe you want to give up that value. Maybe that's not the right one to hold on to. Or gee, I didn't think about that. You know, one of the things I will say to you, and I, you know, it's probably come through indirectly, I think that we are worse off right now for not embracing um, a different world view around our relationship to the planet. You know, and think about all of those cultures which speak about the Earth as Mother Earth, right? And look at our attitude towards what we do. Um, we could learn a lot. We could imagine if you had that view informing your policies, what would it have you do? As opposed to the view informing your policies is, you know, you can't threaten the livelihood of multimillionaires. Livelihood. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks. I remember you saying uh, Jiang Kuihe got um, kind of loopholed into going to prison for uh, doing it without a medical license. So I wanted to ask if you advocate for the scientific community to try and push away from these, not just the scientific community, but also governments to push away funding uh, towards these types of research that are going to drive the, you know, people like, like these uh, researchers who are willing to do anything. Okay, so one of the things, thank you for that question. One of the things that allows me to do is to actually say something that I didn't say in the talk that I think is really important. I actually think in many ways Jean Kuhei is a scapegoat. Okay, so pe people have referred to him as this rogue scientist, et cetera. I think he did exactly what he was trained to do. He was trained to win a Nobel Prize. That's what we train all of our scientists to do, right? To be the first, to be the best, to be the fastest. So first of all, we need to look at our incentive system, right? Um, what was he incentivized to do? I think in a lot of ways he did what he was expected to do. I also think a lot of people propped him up. There's no way he did this without a lot of people knowing. Not everybody. Um, people that work in um, science and technology studies, people that work um, in anthropology have been trying to track who knew. And the most comprehensive list I've seen so far is about 60 people. That's a lot of people that could have blown the whistle, that could have said something, that didn't. So I think we need to think about how science works in the world. Okay. Now, to your point about, um, you know, should we have these kinds of constraints? I think for me, what that does is it speaks to governance. In the report that I showed you from WHO, when we talk about a framework for governance, one of the things we do is we invite people to think about governance not in traditional ways. It's not just treaties. It's not just declarations. It's not just laws. It's not just regulations. It's not just professional guidelines. It's things like funding. Can we take away your funding if it's public money? Well, then what do you do if it's private money? It's things like patents. What do we give them out for? When do we withhold them and say this isn't patentable? It's things like publication. When will we say, no, we won't publish? I mean, it, an interesting part of this story that starts in 2015 is they don't publish it, they say, because of ethics, and yet they publish commentaries, and it's going to come out. And so I think what we really need to think about is this whole thing as sort of an ecosystem of how is it that we want to actually answer the question about the world we want to live in, and then what incentives do we put in place to help create that world? My own view right now is that we have a lot of incentives that take us down a particular path. You know, Scientists, academics, we're pretty smart people. If you tell us which hoops we have to jump through to achieve a particular goal, we can kind of figure out how to do it. So what we need to figure out is who's setting up those hoops and who's setting those goals that we are then chasing um, after. Um, and I, you know, I don't think we've got the right ones in place right now. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. And, and can I say thanks to everybody? These have been great questions, and I can't tell you how happy I am to have an audience again. It's just been so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Of HRI and uh, the IGB, uh, there's a couple people we often need to thank. One of those is Darcy Edmondson uh, for um, <laughs> Castro at HRI for holding it all in, in her hands. 
So thank you very much. For Professor Bayless for inviting us into your ethical universe and insisting that we grapple with everything in it. Um, but for now, we'll thank you, audience, for being very patient and um, with the rattling of all the food covers coming off back there. Now we, we invite you to uh, join us in some conversation and conviviality and, and food and drink with Professor Bayless. So thank you again. Great. Thank you.